G'day. Thanks for making me feel welcome uh, here in the People's Republic of Victoria. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I bring you greetings from the People's Republic of Queensland, from which I've come this morning. Um, I'm going to speak for about 30 minutes. Um, and uh, within this rubric of alternative visions for the country's future, uh, I want to deal with a text on alternative visions for the country's economy. Um, and then let's open it up for a general conversation, if it's okay with you. Um, I'm doing a series this week. I began last night at the University of Queensland. And on this question of, uh, is it practical at this time of the 21st century to craft a coherent national vision for the country's future, uh, both dealing with the structural challenges for our economy, continuing challenges in social justice, uh, as well as the uncertainties now arising in the regional and global order as a consequence of China's rise and America's response, as well as the great and fundamental challenges of climate change. My argument, uh, which underpins uh, this series, is uh, if these things called a national vision were seen as optional marginalia in times past, they've now in fact become fundamentally important for crafting what I think is an uncertain future for our country in a deeply challenging regional and global environment. Ten major challenges uh, which I see for our country's future. Number one, unfolding unprecedented global technology revolution, not change, revolution. On the one hand, challenging Australia's future international economic competitiveness, unless we become innovators ourselves in these next great drivers of global prosperity. Well, on the other hand, also facing the profound employment, social and economic instability that will flow to traditional industries from technological disruption itself. Number two, the profound challenge of sustaining long-term Australian economic growth, given the ageing of our population, static workforce participation rates and negligible productivity growth, compounded by a declining bipartisan consensus on long-term migration flows, uh, inadequate infrastructure investment and, as already noted, a global technology innovation revolution that is beginning to leave Australia behind. Three, the ravages of climate change, where our national and global actions to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions are woefully inadequate to prevent unsustainable temperature increases, increasingly frequent extreme weather events, and with grave consequences for long-term global food and water security, the forced migration of peoples, uh, and here within Australia itself, the sustainability of the Murray-Darling Basin. Four, the failure to prepare sufficiently for the ageing of our population, both through the absence of fundamental health, hospitals and aged care reform, to sustain a high quality health system for our people, while also managing the costs of the system within fiscally sustainable limits, and compounded by a failure to sustain retirement income reform by continuing to increase the superannuation guarantee levy to 12%, thereby underpinning long-term retirement income adequacy and reducing future dependency on government support. Five, a failure to conclude the national reconciliation process with Indigenous Australians uh, through sustained investment in the closing the gap strategy and the completion of constitutional recognition of our First Peoples. Six, a fragmenting global order driven by rising China and increasingly isolationist America, a divided Europe, a yawning global leadership deficit in what appears to be increasingly a G0 world, and the growing danger of a return to pre-45 notions of survival of the nationally fittest. Seven, the increasing polarization of our region between Chinese and American spheres of geostrategic and economic spheres of influence, reducing the freedom of policy maneuver for regional states as they seek to secure their own futures. Eight, the growing wave of people movements across the world by those escaping political, economic or climatic insecurity in their countries of origin, generating in turn politically and racially charged reactions within the countries they escape to that go to the heart 
of the local political concerns on the deepest questions of collective cultural identity, Europe, America, to some extent here. Nine, the polarization of our democracies between rich and poor and an increasingly struggling middle class, the failure of much of the traditional politics of the center right and the center left to deliver sustainable solutions to fundamental problems, compounded by a national media split between Murdoch's far right and what I describe as the faux left <laughs> and the screaming balkanization of social media, destroying any real possibility of a political commons through which and on which to conduct reasonable national debate, dialogue and conversation. And through all these factors, bit by bit, therefore, delegitimizing democracy itself in the eyes of the people. And finally, underpinning all the above, a gaping chasm now emerging in our deepest underlying values. As Christianity declines and almost disappears in the West after 1700 years of cultural domination, driven in large part by the sheer weight of its own institutional hypocrisy, only to be replaced by a secularism increasingly uncertain of its own moral compass to guide what is left of the modern day Enlightenment project and now facing an increasingly self-confident new authoritarianism in China, in Russia and elsewhere, offering alternative modes of political and economic governance. Apart from all that, it's going fine. <laughs> Furthermore, our already troubled democratic institutions are faced with even more fundamental challenge. They're having to deal effectively with these complex, unprecedented challenges simultaneously, simultaneously, while at the same time, the legitimacy of the national and international institutions charged with dealing with these challenges is itself under challenge. These are troubling times. Today I want to discuss uh, alternative futures for our national economy. I want to address the economic pressures now bearing down on us from abroad. I want to address how best to prepare for the risk of real recession uh, in the year ahead, because a failure to do so would set us back a decade in marshalling the political capital necessary for long-term economic reform. But importantly, I want to address the future drivers of Australian growth, given the dangers of declining international competitiveness while simultaneously dealing with the unavoidable imperatives of sustainable development, most critically on climate change. First, the risk of recession. Global economic storm clouds are indeed now gathering. Some of the reasons have to do with the nature of the business cycle, some the new fragilities of the international financial system, and others patently geopolitical, e.g. Trump. The United States is already 10 years into a, its current growth cycle. This is the longest in American modern economic history. Markets are anticipating a correction. The stimulatory impact of the administration's tax cuts has already washed through or their, and their economic impact was less than what the administration had promised. The Fed has historically low interest rates, but there is a general consensus across the West that the classical utility of monetary policy instruments to further stimulate economies has largely been exhausted. Just as there is a view that non-classical approaches through quantitative easing, recently used extensively by central banks in the US and Europe and Japan, cannot be taken further because the effect would now be more limited than before. Another factor generating significant headwinds for the global economy is growing geopolitical risk. There is increasing evidence that the risk and reality of trade protectionism, particularly between the world's two largest economies, China and the US, is having a profound impact on business and investor confidence in these countries and across the world. Markets are also factoring in expectations from the broader impacts of protectionism, where global trade growth itself is now slowing, acting as a net drag on global economic growth. And this is new. Historically, trade has led global economic growth rather than the reverse. Furthermore, the bewildering daily array of tweets, of statements and threatened executive actions and counteractions by the US president coupled with Chinese responses, is increasingly shredding market sentiment. And that's before we factor in other significant 
political and geopolitical risks, including Brexit, the looming Italian sovereign debt challenge given the rolling crises of Italian domestic politics, the impact of US-Iran relations on Gulf oil supplies, as well as the ever-looming potential for crisis concerning the North Korean nuclear program. It was enough to keep the strategic risk business in business. Indeed, political and geopolitical risk is now back with a vengeance, creating an all-pervasive anxiety among financial markets, investors, and the traded sector of the global economy. Taken together, these various factors have increased the real risk of US, Japanese, and European recessions in 2020. Chinese growth is also likely to be depressed considerably by recessions in these countries, as well as from the direct impact of the trade war on China's export sector and declining domestic business confidence because of problematic domestic policy settings for Chinese private firms at home. The recent inversion of the US government bond yield curve, which historically has been a reliable predictor of impending recession, along with persistent negative yield, yield curves in Europe, also points in a decisively negative direction for the year ahead. The risk, therefore, and it gives me no joy to say this, next year for recession in Australia is real. It's not inevitable, it's just a real risk. In which case, the question for the government is how well prepared they are for this in order to prevent it, given the economic carnage it would otherwise produce. So how should Australia respond to this? Given the risk of recession abroad and continued fragilities in the global financial system, Australia should reflect carefully on the lessons from a decade ago when we last faced this challenge and on the series of coordinated policy actions, both at home and abroad, that we deployed in order to avoid it. We should reflect on which of those conditions still exist today and what new approaches may be necessary. In 2008, nine, uh, when my hair was less bleached white than it now is, um, we faced the reality of a global financial crisis, collapsing financial institutions, global recession, and the real prospect of a second global recession. It was fun. Uh, in response, we did the following. We undertook unprecedented fiscal policy intervention. We used monetary policy stimulus. We took radical actions to sustain confidence in financial institutions themselves double bank guarantees. We coordinated stimulus strategies with other G20 countries. We avoided trade protectionism through combined G20 action. We benefited from continued growth in emerging economies, most particularly China. And we were a government politically and psychologically prepared to act with a deep economic crisis on our doorsteps, rather than just waiting for the market mystically to self-correct and the spontaneous actions of the invisible hand, which sometimes proves to be invisible. <laughs> In other words, we were not prepared to simply stand idly by and watch mass unemployment, small business collapse, and the social catastrophe uh, that inevitably results. So a decade later, what's new? What's the same? What's different? One, there is less fiscal policy room to move across all major economies. The state of OECD budget repair and disrepair means that the fiscal capacity to act now is less than it was a decade ago. Two, interest rates are already near zero, meaning traditional monetary policy mechanisms are not available. Three, we are not alert to emerging new challenges to the financial system stability instability, including the explosion of what's called CLOs. Four, the G20 is no longer functioning as an effective policy coordination mechanism, in part because of erratic American leadership. Five, there has now been an outbreak of protectionism of the type which the G20 a decade ago, and I remember the meetings well, explicitly prohibited and by and large largely enforced that prohibition. Six, China too today has less capacity and political appetite for the scale of fiscal stimulus on which it embarked back in 2008-9. And finally, the current Australian government, rather than returning the budget to surplus over the last three to six years when it would have been appropriately counter-cyclical to do so, 
and as it solemnly promised the Australian public during both the 2013 and 2016 elections it would, now seems to be politically obsessed with returning the budget to surplus in 2019-20, precisely at the time when it would be pro-cyclical to do so. In other words, thereby exacerbating any slide towards recession. The timing would, under those circumstances, be all wrong. In other words, we have a government at present with its eyes caught in the headlights, transfixed and immobilised by the fear of its own political obsessions and commitments, seemingly oblivious to the grave dangers of recession now confronting us, and intellectually rigid in its, rep in its response to rapidly changing global economic circumstances, to wit the Treasurer's address to the BCA yesterday. And his attack on me this morning in response to my similar remarks at the University of Queensland last night. But that's all part of the fun and game of Australian politics, except the stuff is serious. The government, of course, will claim that it has introduced significant tax cuts, that the RBA has further reduced interest rates, and that APRA has further relaxed the criteria for bank lending. All true. These measures, however, are already factored in within the context of the continuing softening of national and global markets. And as we face the growing threat of significant and synchronised global economic downturn in the year ahead. The government, therefore, will require much greater intellectual and policy dexterity to anticipate and respond to this unfolding crisis that we see the outline of at present. Instead, we see further evidence of political and policy complacency, part of our deepening national disease of what I describe as the complacent country, Australia. The government, I would argue, must revise its approach. Campbell will need to double down in its special relationship with Washington to fight against the scourge of protectionism, which has now become the leitmotif of the Trump administration and its tariff-obsessed president. What's the point in having a close relationship with the President of the United States if you can't use it for good policy effect? We did so with both the Bush and the Obama administrations. President, uh, Prime Minister Morrison's relationship with President Trump should also be put to good effect. Second, Canberra will have to examine new, innovative approaches to stimulating the economy, including the radical possibility of issuing transfer payments, drawing on the RBA's own balance sheet, on the basis of earlier work of economists including Keynes, Friedman and Bernanke most recently. And third, Canberra should start behaving like a grown-up in the G20, to make it function as the systematic global macroeconomic policy coordination mechanism uh, it was designed to be when we created it during the last crisis. That's its raison d'etre. That's why we did it. Working with a small number of like-minded countries to that effect, rather than simply using it as an episodic forum for national political position-taking and posturing. Unless we're prepared to deal with any upcoming recession effectively, then the rest of my remarks in this address today on the imperatives of long-term economic reform will be rendered irrelevant. Finally, therefore, let's talk about the future drivers of Australian economic growth and what we could do about that. This is my core message today. Economic growth for Australia long term is not a given. It has to be earned. Earned through the combined efforts of our entrepreneurial leadership, our working families and effective public policy. Indeed, the domestic economic headwinds are already strong. An ageing population, static wage growth and declining productivity rate. There are five areas of reform that should become our national priorities, in my view. They are small business tax reform. Two, mandating superannuation funds to invest 1% of their total portfolio in venture capital to take Australian branded tech innovation to market. Three, radically investing in STEM education, training and research across the schools and university sectors, the future drivers of innovation, technology and the new economy. Four, establishing a new jobs and training agency to manage the impact on work from the large disruptions that will flow from new technologies, artificial intelligence most particularly, and providing a new mandate for Infrastructure Australia to plan for what I describe unapologetically as a need for a big Australia for the future and using new nation-building bonds to fund Australia's future infrastructure build. 
a few words about each of these and then we'll close for questions. On tax, small business and our national corporate culture, let me say the following. On growing the economy, the essential challenge is not tax. We in this country, in aggregate, have one of the lowest tax rates in the world. Look at the OECD data. We come within the bottom 10 percentile. Therefore, the argument that we hear so often from this government and the BCA that the reason Australia has not advanced as much as it could in terms of its overall growth rates is because of our overwhelming, overburdening tax rate is absolute political horseshit. It's a technical term in the economic text. <laughs> it simply does not bear up to any form of objective international comparison or analysis. If we are to engineer any form of tax reform, it should be focused explicitly on the small business sector. In other words, our mission statement should be to ensure that those who are the little guys performing entrepreneurially in the Australian economy become middle-sized guys, in turn becoming big companies, and in turn becoming global companies and global brands for Australia. The challenge of public policy through the tax system is to make it easier, much easier, for those who are in start-up phase. That, I would argue, is critical. If you were to survey, by contrast, the other end of the business community, that is members of the Business Council of Australia, the BCA, um, on the proportion of Australia's top firms and ask what proportion of their chief executives or board members have served in management positions in Asia, the largest centre of global growth for the 21st century, the answer would be very thin indeed. Australian corporate elites have remained in large part a self-satisfied white male elite. I hope I've offended a lot of people in the room. Um, for whom Asian markets have proven to be just too hard. Yet we are the only Western country located on Asia's doorstep, which should provide us with a major natural advantage, which we have failed miserably to uh, realise. The uncomfortable truth is that beyond commodities, education and tourism, our corporate performance in the world's largest emerging markets in China, Japan, India and next door in Indonesia has been statistically abysmal. Beyond Asia, the fact that Australia made, Australia's major corporates have failed to generate a single universally recognisable global brand since the war says everything. Name me one major Australian global brand known in every boardroom in the world. I cannot do that. There is something deeply lacking in the entrepreneurial culture of much of Australia's major corporates. They are very good at handing out rolling critiques on the evils of the Australian trade union movement. However, their capacity for what I would describe as intelligent self-reflection about the inadequacy of their own entrepreneurial culture warrants separate analysis. For example, Asian Australians should be appointed in large numbers to the boards of Australian firms, to senior management positions, to build bridges to Asian markets. And innovation and enterprise should be taught in the nation's secondary schools so that the school, school and university graduates conclude that it is natural, not unusual, to graduate and to go and start up a business rather than simply flushing the nation's talents down the drain by always sending our brightest and our best off to the compliance-based professions of law and accounting. My apologies to both <laughs> faculties here today. Much of Australia's business leadership, despite reflexively laying the blame for their own corporate performance at the feet of government and unions, in reality leads the nation in our self-satisfied culture of national complacency. That'll earn me more friends. Innovation. One further impediment to economic growth is the rolling failure of Australia's venture capital markets to back Australian innovation. The loss of Australian IP abroad is the continuing story of much of our post-war economic history. Wi-Fi is the most recent tragic case in point. Developed in large part in Australia, this critical innovation was lost abroad in 1999 because of a failure to locate sufficient venture capital to take it to global market. Imagine the global branding opportunities for Australia today if this had become one of ours around the world. Aussie-fi. Imagine what it could have been. <laughs> Everyone uses Wi-Fi. We invented the bugger. 
it could have become our very own Apple. The loss of these opportunities in IT and biotechnology and nanotechnology and new materials research and artificial intelligence and blockchain and big data must stop. We have five of the world's top 100 research universities, including this one, our leading research university in the uh, world's top 100, Melbourne University. We are also host to world-class biomedical research institutes in our major cities, particularly Melbourne and Brisbane and to some extent Sydney. They produce world-class research and innovation, yet the constant failure lies in the entrepreneurial and the venture capital side in taking world-class innovation to full global market potential. It takes risk. I thought that's what capitalism was about, but I'm just a social democrat. What would I know? <laughs> Governments cannot mandate the banks to adopt a more creative approach to national wealth generation. But because the nation's superannuation funds, both public and private, and the wider financial service industry benefit enormously from a legislated superannuation guarantee levy, the time has come to consider mandating a small percentage of their combined investments, say 1%, to be directed to Australian venture capital projects in order to commercialise Australian sourced innovation. Although, although representing a tiny amount for each fund, given the overall size of what is now virtually a $2 trillion industry, in aggregate, this would create sufficient critical mass in the venture capital industry in this country to meet the demand of our innovators who are hungry for new investment. This could make a strategic difference if funds are forced to work hard to find new investments from our thousands of innovators in generating new sources of long-term wealth for their members, that is, the members of these pension funds. The funds, of course, will scream from the rooftops about the impact of any such socialist directive um, and what it would have on their fiduciary duty to maximise return to policyholders. The funds I've discovered, however, scream less when these returns are compromised by the fee structures these same fund managers happily impose on a generally unwitting Australian public. Third, the future of STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths. On the impact of technological uh, change on existing industries and employment, the challenge of course is large. Given that these changes are likely to gather in pace rather than the reverse, there are three types of responses necessary for Australia. The first is a large-scale reinvestment in STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering and maths, across the school, further education, higher education systems. All other serious countries are doing just this right now, led in fact by our friends in China. Australia, according to the PISA ratings, is now falling behind. This must be urgently reversed as a strategic national priority. My government, you may recall, instituted a policy whereby if you studied maths and science at university, we would abolish half your hex. If you then worked in maths and science post-graduation, we would abolish the other half of your hex debt. That policy didn't survive the change in government. Second, the creation of a critical mass in Australia venture capital funds as recommended above is urgent. This is the only way new industries and jobs will be created. And third, for this to become a matter of strategic bipartisan consensus in this country for the future. Finally, and perhaps most controversially, my recommendations for a big Australia. I believe we must aim to build a big Australia, not just in size, but also, frankly, in the capacity of our national imagination, for the contributions we, don't, we make not just for ourselves for the future, but to the region and the wider world. We are sometimes sucked in to a deeply provincial view of our national capacities and ability to influence the world beyond our shores. But let me take specifically the question of the economy. Neither maximum workforce participation or productivity growth alone will generate an economy large enough and a workforce young enough to pay for this country's future. The ageing of our population is real. The impact on future retirement income, health and aged care costs will be prohibitive. These cannot be wished away within an electoral cycle, though some seek to do so. And this leaves to one side the future cost of our national defence. Remember our national defence. We have one of the largest territorial land masses on the planet. We have, I think, the third largest coastline in the world. Uh, we have the third largest special economic zone in the world. 
exclusive economic zone in the world, um, and we are 25 million people. And think into the future what it would be like if America continues to drift into an isolationist never-never land. Uh, what it would take for this country to independently fund its own future national defence in radically changing strategic circumstances. And if we think we can do that comfortably on the back of a greying ageing population base of 25 million, then whatever you're smoking, I'd like some. <laughs> Consistent with the law. <laughs> hey, in the United States, it's changing. For Australia to sustain its future standard of living and meet its future social policy and national security policy needs, we need a much larger population. That's why we need to plan effectively for an optimum population size. Uh, we should aim at doubling our national population in the second half of the century through an enhanced skilled migration program. You see, countries of around 50 million, so long as other national infrastructure policy and environmental sustainability policy settings are in place, are more likely to have sufficient critical mass to sustain themselves in a highly uncertain future given the relative size of their domestic markets and their capacity to fund their own national security requirements. A big Australia is not incompatible with properly mandated urban planning, infrastructure development, environmental sustainability. By global standards, you live in a pretty big city. And to frankly commend uh, the Victorian State Government, uh, you have managed reasonably the demands of growth relative to other major cities in this country and the world. I live in Manhattan. Let me tell you, you're doing pretty well. So my argument is it is not compatible with the development of new population centres in the water-rich northern parts of our country, that is a big Australia, nor does it prevent mandating new migrants to move to these regions rather than the capital cities to avoid overcrowding. All this is doable and at a pace and composition of migration flow that maintains social stability on the way through. Of course, there'll be vigorous reaction to this proposal as well. It's easy to vigorously react to any proposal for the future. Um, and that's because everybody is running for cover while no one is answering the core question that in the absence of continuing significant migration flows, who on earth is going to fund our most fundamental future national needs from health and aged care to retirement incomes to national defence in an increasingly unstable region? We run the risk of being a young country which becomes old before its time. These are the seeds indeed of national decline. To accompany this, we will need an even more robust infrastructure Australia to ensure that we have the roads, rail, ports, electricity supply, water supply, waste management systems and high-speed broadband. Do you remember that? Um, <laughs> in order to underpin long-term population growth. We have to rebuild the NBN network. Otherwise, we will fall even further behind the rest of the world. Infrastructure Australia will also need new sources of infrastructure financing. New types of nation-building bonds will be needed with returns comparable to those offered by regular government paper. This will be necessary if the big projects of the future, for example, high-speed rail between our major capital cities, are ever to be built. Otherwise, we'll be full of plans, but with limited finance to give them effect, and our growth potential will be strangled as a result. To conclude, there are many other elements of a national vision other than the economy, just as there are many other parts of a national policy strategy uh, if we are to secure our future in the uncertain century that lies ahead. But unless we secure our policy, all, uh, sorry, unless we secure our economy, all else fails. And a complacent country, the complacent country which we are becoming, will have become instead a failed state. Hard decisions must be taken. Not those demanded by the political right, but instead those of the reforming centre. And if we do so, the rewards for our people and our nation will be great indeed. I thank you for your attention. <laughs>